Welcome to the ASU Washington Center. I'm Mahmoud Farouk with the ASU Consortium for Science, Policy, and Outcomes. Let me introduce our uh, uh, host, who is uh, today my, uh, the director, co-director of CSPO, Consortium of Science, Policy, and Outcomes, Dan Sierowitz, uh, who is also has taken up a new role as the editor of Issues of Science and Technology Policy, um, and uh, Rob Charette. Uh, who uh, wrote the piece in IEEE Spectrum about the STEM mid crisis for which we, we are all here to discuss. Basically, the format for these sorts of events are we want to have lots of conversations, so, so we will have Bob talk for 20 minutes or so. 20 minutes. Um, I'll ask him, I'll throw him a couple softballs so we can develop a few of the themes that he uh, has introduced, and then we'll open it up for discussion for another half hour or so. First of all, I'm, I'm a contributing editor. I'm not a journalist by trade. Uh, I'm a dilettante journalist. I normally spend a year to two years, sometimes three years, researching something. And I, I looked at this for a couple different reasons, this particular issue, because I have a daughter who's now in the eighth grade. She actually wrote the editorial for Spectrum's issue in September uh, and talked about her perspective because she's an eighth <laughs> grader. She's very good in science, very good in mathematics. The school she went to, I'm from Spotsylvania County, for those of you who don't know where that is, Fredericksburg, Virginia. Uh, down toward Richmond. And uh, they were an Intel Science Award finalist in STEM. They have a STEM program. They've had STEM programs in the elementary schools for several years now. I teach, I volunteer in, in the schools teaching science and engineering to, to the kids. And um, part of this was to say, okay, well, where is the career going? I got my undergraduate degree in electrical and computer systems engineering from the University of Massachusetts in Amherst back in 1977. If you do the math, you can kind of figure out how old I am. And you have to add a few more years because I was in the military before that. Um, so when I take a look at the field of when I graduated and where the field is today, it's much, much different. And the kids who are graduating face a much different environment. However, the one thing that hasn't changed since I've graduated has been this kind of repeated call that there's been a crisis in either scientists and engineers, that there's been a shortage and that we need to have more. Otherwise, the country's going to go you know, hell in a handbasket. Um, excuse my, my French. I am French, so I can say that. Um, so uh, you know, part of this was, was personal. And I wanted to dig into this. And, and uh, I have. And I tried to take it. I'm a, right now, I run two, two consultancy companies. Uh, my area of expertise now is in enterprise risk management. I do large-scale audits. I do a lot for the Department of Defense. I do a lot for large tocos and others. So I decided to approach this as if I was an auditor doing a risk assessment. Because we have basically two competing ideas. That there's a massive STEM shortage of, of hundreds of thousands, if not millions of STEM students, as well as, no, there isn't. <laughs> OK. And, and a lot of the people who say that, that there wasn't have, have done studies. They've done it at RAND. They've done it at the Economic Policy Institute here in town, um, Defense Science Board. People have taken a look and said there's, there's really no shortage. There are spot shortages, but there's no major shortage. So who's right? And that's why I wrote this piece. So I came into peace. Uh, again, I started this over two years ago, actually thinking that there was probably a shortage. Okay? Because I, I didn't come in thinking that there wasn't one. I actually, I'm an engineer. Of course, we always need more engineers. Engineers are good guys. Um, can't have enough of them. Um, you know, the, the folks in, in defense as well as in telcos have been saying, well, we need to have more skills. So I started digging in from that perspective. So the, I'm just going to go very quickly through these slides. They're not really, they're just more talking points to let me get done in 20 minutes. Otherwise, for those of you who, you don't know me, but you might uh, know me by the time I'm done, I don't shut up. So um, this is one way to get, get through. Does any, anybody Can you not take those shin guards off yeah. so just, in, just in case? <laughs> does, does anybody not know what STEM stands for? OK, that's good. Okay. But in, in short bits, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And the concern has, has been growing, especially the most recent set of concerns. There are a number of papers that were sponsored by the National Science Foundation, the National Academy of Sciences, the Institute of Medicine. Uh, these, were, these were called, you know, basically the um, rising, the gathering storm, the rising of the gathering storm 
papers, Norm Augustine, who's a retired chairman of, of Lockheed Martin, was the primary author or, or coordinator. I shouldn't say he was just the, the only author. They had a lot of folks from industry. And basically their concern was is that we were facing in the United States a crisis back in uh, 2004, 2005, when the first papers were coming out, saying that we did not have enough scientists and engineers, that there was a mass shortage that, that uh, was developing, that there was a shortage then, it was going to get worse. The first paper came out in 2005, the second one came out in 2007, you know, basically a flat earth society, you know, are we, are, are we basically, as the United States, have we given up on scientists and engineers? And then the 2000 paper saying that, that basically, you know, we're at, at category five, okay, using the Katrina uh, mantra. And, um, you know, Bill Gates, you know, again, being representative of, of the high tech community, you know, came out with a quote in front of, con you know, testifying to Congress back in 2007. Um, don't hold me to these dates because sometimes it just merges. Um, is U.S. companies face a severe shortfall of scientists and engineers with expertise to develop the next generation of breakthroughs. If we don't reverse these trends, our competitive advantage will erode. And, you know, the, the, the concern was so great that President Bush II, uh, as well as President Obama, uh, started programs through the NSF and others to try to encourage the education, the graduation of scientists and engineers. President Obama in 2009 started this uh, Educate to Innovate in his uh, State of the Union address in 2011, said we need to out-innovate, out-educate, and out-build the rest of the world. You know, this, this notion of that we have, we're, we're in this, this competitive world that if we, if we don't have, have uh, enough technologists and scientists, our standard of living will go down. And so uh, President Obama uh, set out uh, a couple different initiatives, uh, but basically set a goal of 10,000 new American engineers and 100,000 new STEM graduates every year for the next 10 years, and wanted to prepare 100,000 additional STEM teachers with strong teach teaching skills and deep content knowledge by 2020, and he requested that another $3 billion be spent on STEM education annually. Not, that was over and above, originally, the $3 billion plus that NSF is, has been spending in research. So there was a, a, a large push uh, to, to increase the number of, of engineers by about, depending on how you count, anywhere from 7 to 13 percent. and. Uh, about 20% or thereabouts in terms of STEM students every year. Okay, so you know there was there was this this really you know here we have a have a problem we're going to go have a solution to it. Well, if you take a look, it turns out that everybody has this problem. Uh, and if you go and you check, you know, in Japan, I just listed in, in uh, the paper, you know, some of the headlines from different news stories, but, you know, high-tech Japan running out of engineers. UK must produce high-caliber science graduates. Singapore is running out of engineers. Brazil is running out of engineers. Everybody's running out of engineers. In fact, what's interesting about this is that it's kind of this game of, you know, who has the biggest STEM crisis, okay? And, and what's happening is that what you find is, is that each of the countries tend to use the other countries as a motivator. So if you, if you read the papers and the reports in Singapore, they'll say, well, there's, there's India and, and China and the U.S. are producing all these scientists and engineers, and, and they're going to overproduce, so we have to have more. The U.K. uses Singapore, India, and China. Uh, Canada uses, you know, pick your poison. It, it, they're, everybody's using everybody else as a justification. And yet, if you start to dig behind this, um, you start to find out that there's, there's voices of, of skepticism in each one of these countries. Uh, for instance, Australia has had this, this uh, the chief scientist for, for Australia um, has been calling for a couple hundred thousand new STEM graduates in Australia because they're running out of engineers. And yet, if you talk to the recruiters in Australia, they'll tell you that, for instance, in information and computer technology, uh, unemployed person going to a recruiter has to wait about a year before they'll get a job. If you go to the UK, the manpower surveys show that employers are admitting that 60% in the last survey admitted that, well, they didn't really have a skill shortage. What they really had is that they had a lack of students who were willing to take the wages that they were paying. 
So on one hand, again, everybody is claiming the shortage, but on the other hand, you find out that, that you know, there's maybe a little bit more to this. And even in India, it's the same, same deal, where they're graduating supposedly 800,000 engineers, and yet they have a massive shortage as well. So if you take a look, uh, and one of the things I tried to do is just list, these are just some of the surveys going back to the 50s, some of the reports going back to the 50s that cast doubt on the STEM crisis notion, because again, in the 50s we had a STEM crisis, in the 60s we had a STEM crisis, in the 70s we had a STEM crisis, in the 80s we had a STEM crisis, in the 90s we had a STEM crisis, and we have another STEM crisis. But each time, if you go back, and I went back all the way to the 1890s, by the way, um, looking at archives. So one of the nice things about the internet is that you can actually go to newspaper archives, the, the IEEE has their archives of scientific papers all the way back in the 1890s. You'll find that, again, these cries of crises have other reports that come out and say, well, no, not really. Um, but there's always these motivating factors. In the U.S., there's been motivating factors in terms of the Soviet Union in the 1950s, the Japanese in the 1970s and 1980s, the Indians and Chinese now. Um, and again, it, it's the same type of motivating forces. But if you take a look, for instance, back in 1957, Blank and Stigler wrote a report which was published in the uh, National Bureau of Economic Research, which basically, because in the 50s there was this very big worry that there was a scientist, and especially engineering shortfall, uh, took a look at the data which basically said, well, there's really not a shortage. Well, this happened in 57. They published, I believe, in June of that year. Uh, what happened in October of that year? Right. So what happened all of a sudden was that that, that notion, and Stigler got his Nobel Prize later in his biography, he said that that, that notion that there was no shortage, uh, basically people tried to suppress it in government at that time. But he's wrong about other things too. Well, he may be, but, but if you take a look, again, he wasn't the only report in, the, in that period that, that was looking at that. But the, the, the issue is, again, it, it, it says that if you're, from my perspective, is that if you're crying shortage time and time again, is it, you know, is it somebody from like well, myself to write a paper saying there's no shortage versus other people who have a shortage who have to really show that there is one? Now, as I said, my approach was to take it as, a, as an auditor or as a, as a risk assessor and go in and try to look at, at the data. What's interesting to me as an engineer is that we try as best we can to work on real concrete data. You know, as one of my engineering professors, when I was taking my engineering economics, says, you know, you build a bridge, bridge falls down, no partial credit. Okay. Um, here, there's a lot of data, but it's very inconsistent. It's very noisy. Everybody counts differently. So if you take a look at the Commerce Department and, and a lot of the Bureau of Labor Statistics of how they look at it, they claim that there's 7.6 million individuals work in STEM jobs in, 2000, in, in 2010. You take a look at what NSF measures, and they measure 12.4. Now, what's the difference? Well, the Commerce Department doesn't count uh, PhDs in medicine, for instance. Social scientists don't count, okay, because those are not part of what they would consider scientists. Now, you can ar argue whether or not social scientists should count or not. That's not, that's, you know, not my concern. <laughs> I, I needed to pick one. And then again, if you take a look at Brookings, Brookings has another approach, which says, well, there's really 26 million individuals who work in STEM and how they look at it, and it's, it's valid as well, saying that if you do work that's, that's in one of these four STEM areas on your, in your field, then you should probably be considered a STEM uh, worker, which is fine. And in fact, if you go back to 1964, that was the same argument that the Johnson administration made back then in terms of saying we needed to have more vocation, uh, vocational schools. We shouldn't just be concentrating on, on bachelor's degrees. So the poison I picked to try to make it as consistent as possible was to take a look at the Commerce Department perspective because that was where there was pretty good numbers and it was the most consistent over the longest period of time. But that said, even that changed because they like to change their labor classifications. So if you go back just even back to the 1990s and you try to say, okay, how do you count scientists and engineers? You find out that they change their labor classification so all of a sudden the numbers don't line up anymore. Uh, so, again, any of these numbers, you have to be careful. And as I wrote in the article, you know, it, depending on where you want to be, you can cherry pick whatever numbers you want. Okay. Now, I tried, again, to be up front in the article um, and in the, in the other articles that are on the website of, of where these numbers came from, and we tried to document where, what numbers we used to have some consistency. So, 
if you have an issue with the numbers, fine. I'm more than happy to talk about them. But again, you know, I acknowledge up front that these numbers are squishy. Okay, not a technical term, but probably probably as good as you're going to get. So when we took a look, one of the first things of looking at a shortage is, well, how many people are being graduated? How many jobs are open? And then can you take a look over some trend line and see what's there? And so if you take a look at basic you know, supply and demand, and I took the Georgetown uh, study in terms of the, the, the 2010 report, and they estimated a certain number of folks that would, be that would need to have STEM jobs, uh, both new graduates as well as replacements, and they came up with a number of, of around 2.7 million over a 10-year period um, of replacements and, and new workers. So I said, okay, well, there's a good baseline. We'll say, you know, they used the, kind of the Commerce Department numbers. This is what that came out in 2010? 2010. 2010. Or it, 2010. No, that was a report that came out in 2000. They did the 2008 to 2018. Okay, now they're more recent, and, and so I took that number. Yeah, the more recent, when you include 2008, it's a tremendous variation. Well, and, and, but that's one of the things that they have. Now, if you take a look, right, the number we use is 277,000. Now, their May report that they came out, they reduced the number, right? They're going to go from 2010 to 2020. So instead of 277,000, they now say there's about 245,000. Okay, but if you're conservative, let's be nice and use the, use the higher number. Now, if you take a look at you know, what's in, what's in the pipeline, all right, and again, we can argue about whether or not every one of these would be going for these 277,000 jobs, but you can add it up, and there's about 440,000 who are in that pipeline that are graduating that could theoretically go after those jobs, and that does not count the 160,000 plus veterans who, who um, the White House this past year is trying to get certificates to be able to compete in the IT community. So you add another 160,000 to this number, okay? Now, is that 160,000 a year? Well, we again, can argue that, that number. But again, from a, and, and that doesn't count, there's another 11.4 million people in the United States who have STEM degrees who are not working in the STEM community. And even in STEM jobs, only about uh, two-thirds or less actually have STEM degrees working in STEM jobs as defined by the Commerce Department. So again, you, you can, from, from a gross windage perspective, you say, well, it, there seems to be more people graduating and available than there are jobs. Okay, that's, that's one point. Well, what about wages? Because wages is another trend that you would look at to see if there's a shortage. The economists tend to say that if, if there's a shortage, wages should, should start to go up. Well, again, if you take a look at the trend lines, and I just used the DICE survey, they, they concentrate on tech professionals, mostly in the IT computer space, the ones that are there in most demand. You take a look at 2001 through 2012, uh, you'll see that the average salary has not really changed. In fact, it's lower than it was in 2001. If you go to the data that, that, is, in, that is out of the uh, University of Michigan, that, that, uh, or Northwest University, that looks back, back to the 19, 1955, um, and I think I have that data in, in the extra notes in the back. Uh, again, salaries have not really changed very much. In fact, my graduation salary in 1977 is about the same as what an engineer gets today, inflation adjusted. How does that compare to average graduate salary in this period? I, I'm, I'm sorry? How does this number, your numbers, compare to average bachelor's salary in this period? It's about the same. It's in that, that they, they haven't really changed very not, much. Neither have changed. Not really changed very much. There was a peak. In fact, the one nice thing for engineers and computer scientists was the dot-com boom because it actually pushed salaries up. It spiked it up to this $86,000 average salary for, for tech professionals. Before that, it was about 83, 82, 83,000. So it was about a $4,000 bump. For engineers, that's actually stayed. For computer scientists and computer people, it's actually dropped. So engineers may, actually made out better with the dot-com boom than, than the computer people did. Now, how have companies, you know, the, the next thing you need to take a look at is, well, what have companies done? Given that there's a shortage, okay, that there's this massive shortage, what are, what are they doing? What are, are, they, are they training people? No. Um, are they, you know, hiring experienced engineers? Well, that doesn't seem to be, especially out in, in, the, high, in the high tech area in the valley, that doesn't seem to be true at all. In fact, what, what we've changed, again, when I, when I got graduated, um, Somewhere in the neighborhood of 90% of my graduating class, actually the class behind me, if you take a look at NSF statistics, were still working in their major two years later. 
Now that's how they framed it, in their major. Today, if you take a look at the class of 2006 and you take a look at what they were working in in 2008, about 56 to 60 percent were working in their broad area of their major. Okay, they don't give you a stat of how many are actually working in their major. I would assume that it's probably less than that high end, high end number. So if you take a look, you know, the, the people, the employers are using just in time hiring and firing. They're, they're, you know, they want the skill. You know, it's what Peter Capelli, you know, wrote in his, in his book, you know, The Purple Squirrel. You know, they're looking for that person who has I, the ideal job skill and they're not willing to, to go out and, and, and hire it. Um, you know, Microsoft says that it has about 6,000 to 10,000 open jobs, 6,000 or so in, in uh, their uh, open recs. And last year or the year before, they had close to a million applicants for those 6,000 and they couldn't find find those people. Now what's interesting about the 6,000 open jobs is about the same as their turnover rate. So it's pretty hard to say that you have a, a shortage when it matches your turnover rate. At least even not being an economist, that seems a little strange to me. Um, and there is this viewpoint that guest workers um, have better skills. Now what's interesting in, in the UK, um, a skill, a lot of the skill shortage the employers complain about is that they're not good team players. They don't have good communication skills. So is that a, you know, again, if you want to count that as a skill, well, you can, but that's not, kids coming out of, out of school tend not to be really well versed in team play and being, in, you know, what you would have as an engineer. When I was an engineer, you weren't considered an engineer. I worked for government for the Navy Department the first, first uh, eight years of my career, is that you weren't considered an engineer until you had six or seven years under your belt. That was, that was just it. So, you know, to look for a graduating engineer as an undergrad or even a master's or a PhD who hasn't worked in industry, to be able to be an immediate contributing member is, is pretty, um, I think it's, un, it's, it's unreasonable. Uh, but that's, that's the nature of the beast now. Now, so if you take a look, and I talked to Ron here up at, at Rochester uh, Institute of Technology. Uh, you know, he, Ron has studied this area for a long time, especially with the H-1B visa uh, issue, you know, he, he says if you, if you take a look, if there was really a STEM labor crisis, you'd see very different behaviors. You would see companies not cutting their retirement contributions. They'd be hiring new workers and giving them, you know, or, or hiring new workers and giving them worse benefits. You would see signing bonuses. You'd see wage increases. You'd see companies really training their incumbent workers. You don't really see this happening, okay? There isn't a lot of, of you know, companies who are going out and saying that this is what they do. I'm not saying that none do, but from a general perspective um, that would say you have to influence policy to get all these new engineers and scientists, well, again, there seems to be a disconnect. What's more interesting is after we wrote the paper, uh, this always happens, of course, um, after we got the paper uh, at, at, at press, um, Stephen Goodman was, uh, who, who runs the CEO, he's the CEO of Bright.com, they're a big recruiter for the Valley. They, they have millions of resumes for the IT community. Um, they, they put out a report saying that um, we did a really close analysis of our database of resumes versus what Silicon Valley is saying that they need in terms of jobs. Of the 12 job categories that they're screaming that they don't have skilled workers for, uh, we have more than enough for nine of those 12 skills. And in fact, if you read, there's a, there's a couple of good, good articles uh, uh, quoting Goodman, and there's one in the New York Times, but he basically says, we're Silicon Valley people. We just assumed the shortage was true. And in fact, when you talk to people like uh, Michael, uh, I'm probably going to pronounce his name wrong, Teitelbaum. Um, Teitelbaum. Teitelbaum. He, he goes into depth about why has there been this 50, 60 year recurring, what he calls alarm boom bust phase. And he talks about, well, you know, once you can, once industry you know, says that there's a shortage and convinces people on the Hill that there's a shortage and, you know, there's a lot of self-interest, you know, universities have interest in, in creating a, a shortage as well because, again, there's more money that comes to universities. In fact, the one criticism we had when we had the paper sent out, because one of the things maybe you don't realize about Spectrum Magazine is that it, they do go out and get peer-reviewed. So the, the, the article got peer-reviewed by some very top-flight people in the field, uh, both who say there was a shortage as well as not. So this isn't just my opinion and, and so these are, these are every paper is, is critiqued pretty heavily by some pretty uh, 
uh, top people. Um, basically, what, what Michael said is, is that you, know, you go through this phase, and it's been going through this phase every decade or so. And we go through this, this period. And in fact, if, we, if you take a look at the numbers in computer science uh, at the end of the dot-com boom, well, you saw that you know, there was this large growth in the number of computer science graduates in the late 90s, which fell off a cliff when the dot-com boom went bust. And then those kids who stayed in that area all went up to Wall Street because they could make a lot more money. Okay, and now we're, we're growing that back again. And in fact, we'll probably have uh, reach the, the 2000 or the 1997-98 rate probably in the next two years because this past year I think it, the increase was about 20 percent in over a 10 percent from the previous year in terms of, of new computer science uh, students. So as Gene said we put this this paper out it was very interesting we put it out on the Friday before Labor Day at about four o'clock in the afternoon and by Sunday Labor on Sunday, Labor Day weekend, there was over 60,000 people had read their article, which was unexpected. Um, I did not expect to be here talking about this, to be honest, when I wrote this paper. Uh, it's nice to be here, but that wasn't, you know, we thought there would, because this article, you know, this issue has been talked about a lot by ASU and others who've, who've talked about this. Now, when it came out, it was interesting, again, another set of reactions. Um, we got some pushback immediately. The, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce wrote a, a piece within about four days of the article coming out um, uh, called a fact sheet. Uh, the very first fact was wrong. They called the IEEE a union. Um, <laughs> you know, we're not a union. Uh, and I don't represent the IEEE uh, in this piece. I represent me. I'm a contributing editor, but I, I, as I said, I run a couple of companies. Um, and so, again, their argument was, well, it isn't about the quantity, about the quality. And then others, uh, some people in the community uh, here in town who are lobbyists for the high-tech industry said, well, it's both the quality and the quantity. Uh, and then some of the other pushback was that your data is wrong or your interpretation is wrong. And again, it gets me back to, to my question of is, well, it's really not up to me to be proving you wrong. It's really for, if you scream on a shortage, it's really up to you to prove that there's a shortage, again, given that you cry wolf for the last 50 years. So anyway, that's, that's kind of where we're at. I, I want to leave you, you know, with, with two last thoughts. In, in the paper, and this is, again, more personal, is I think, again, going into the schools, it's, it's amazing. Um, I, last week, I taught at my local elementary school. I taught first graders. Uh, I was teaching them about day and night and, and the four seasons. And it's like teaching 30 CEOs. Um, I shouldn't say this on, on tape, but I'm going to anyway. Is, uh, you know, they have attention spans that are fairly small. They want to talk about something else that you're talking about. Uh, normally, dinosaurs is the big <laughs> deal in, in the first grade. Um, and um, they always want to talk about the first slide after you've completed your presentation. Um, but from my perspective of what they need at the schools, and I see this in, in the elementary schools, I see it at, at um, the middle schools. I have a lot of friends of mine who are professors at universities. Uh, we're not doing a very good job at that, at that core level. You know, society is much more complicated today, and we, do, we need some of that. And I think, again, a lot of the STEM shortage would be solved if we just did what we promised we were going to do in 1990 when we started the H-1B visa program. The H-1B visa program, a lot of it was sold in 1990 to allow American education to improve science and technology training. And we have fallen pretty poorly in that, that sphere. Now, the reasons for that are, are many and very outside my concern. But one of the areas, too, is that we got to be very careful not to push STEM at, at the expense of, of the arts and sciences. If you go back to the very earliest days of electrical engineering, back in the 1890s, where electrical engineers were considered mechanical engineers and who thought themselves better than mechanical engineers. But the, but the giants of our time, of, of our field in, in the 1890s, talks about the need for Renaissance engineers. They wanted engineers, electrical engineers, to have a very strong arts background, liberal arts background, because they wanted engineers with common sense. And I think we've got to be very careful of pushing STEM at the expense of arts and sciences. Norm Augustine, who I've known for, for some time, talked, we, we quoted, uh, quoted him in, in the article about the need for engineers to have good writing and communication skills. Because he said that you can find any engineer he, 
you know, he has, he has great engineers. He doesn't have a lot of engineers who can really communicate, who have that broad background to understand. And I think that's what we need. And I think from my perspective, again, as I, I mentioned in the piece, kids today are going to live to 100. Okay. They're gonna, or, or older. You know, we already see this demographic. Then. They're, gonna, they're not going to retire. I tell my daughter, you're not going to retire until you're 80. Okay. And she's like, eh. But they're going to have multiple careers. And so how do we train the kids to learn how to learn? How do we set up society to help that? Because what we're doing, and my daughter wrote about this, is we're turning kids off science and technology. Not really a good thing to do. So you know, we need to look at this differently. My last thought is really these critical decisions are being made uh, you know, a lot on, on faulty data, noisy data, poor assumptions. You know, we haven't really tested these. You know, from a risk assessment standpoint, you know, the very first thing we, we take a look at are the assumptions underneath the project. If the assumptions are wrong, guess what? You're probably not going to be very successful. Okay, we, we're making a lot of assumptions that are untested in terms of this STEM crisis. We, we are, you know, in a position of maybe wasting, maybe not maybe, I think we are wasting our resources, trying to, again, solve the purple squirrel issue versus what's really needed. And that, you know, we really need a, a, a public discourse on this, which is really one of the reasons why we're having this. I think, you know, what, what affected me the most is after the article came out and I heard from a lot of undergraduates, one, one woman in particular who just got her BS in physics from Ohio State. She she's, has majored in the area of, of laser physics. Applied to over 120 companies, cannot find a job. She's willing to move anywhere to do this. She was told, oh, get a degree in physics. This is an area they need this. Well, now she's looking, I think, at going back to grad school, which is going to be very difficult because she had to take a lot of loans to get her degree at, at Ohio State. It's, she's not the only one. There's lots of folks, older engineers, who have contacted me and said, hey, I'd like to get back. You know, I can't find a job. I've been out at, you know, the kids, you know, that, I won't be hired because I'm, I'm, I'm too old. Okay, if you read some of the things that engineers of my age are trying to do in the valley, you know, they're getting eyelids, eyelid lips, you know, coloring their hair, trying to look young, making sure that they don't carry things like blackberries up to my mouth. <laughs> like, I would never make it in the valley. Um, so, again, I think, is there a need for more science and edu engineering education? Yeah, I do. I think, though, that we have to take with a very large grain of salt this claim of a shortage. And we also have to, again, it's beyond what we did in the piece, but we can talk about it here, about this thing of, of H-1B immigration and what that means. Because again, you have, you have Alan Greenspan who says that we need, to, we need, as a country, to lower the wages of skilled workers because they're too high in this country. You have Gary Becker who won the Nobel Prize in Economics in 92 says, well, we need to bring in a million high-tech people from Asia, Europe, anywhere we can get them. Because it may, it may hurt American engineers and scientists, but it'd be great for the country. Well, if that's what we want, that's fine. But let's, let's tell our kids that that's the field. That's, the, that's what they're faced. Anyway, I'm, I'm off my soapbox. So thank you. And we're... Thanks, Bob. So let me just make a, a couple comments. And yeah. maybe uh, we can talk a little bit more and then open it up uh, for everybody. First, first is... Um, just contextualizing the, the, the STEM workforce issue in the broader science policy um, uh, debate over the years, it's really just one example of many where there's continual claims of disaster. Mm -hmm. um, so we're not innovative enough, we don't have enough in, medical, in biomedical research, we don't have enough in the physical sciences. And I think a lot of this can simply be seen as, it's, a lot, it's, it's much easier to ask for more than to look within the system and try to understand why it's not functioning well. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's what you're saying yeah. about the STEM system, uh, but it's also true when you get into budget, uh, budget debates and the insistence that we have, that, that for example, the standard metric that the US uh, isn't spending a big enough percentage of its GDP on R&D. There, there's nothing about percentage of GDP as, as, that, that suggests that that should be a meaningful metric of the quality uh, of the, of the um, R&D in, endeavor. So, it's a, so we see this kind of argument a, a, across, um, 
uh, across science and technology policy issues. Um, and also just as one, just to, to reinforce um, uh, the, 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 the point that this is not, there's nothing new about this controversy. In the early 90s when I was on the Hill, the uh, National Science Foundation had reported in one of its um, official documents, an impend they had projected an impending scientist shortfall uh, and despite the fact that they actually had documents from the Office of Technology Assessment telling them that it was wrong, we had a hearing, we, they, we embarrassed them, it didn't matter, no one seems to learn. Um, one, I wanted to ask you some, uh, I guess two things. One is there, there seems to be a sort of a voodoo economics at, 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 that's taken hold here that's kind of um, assumes that if we have more good engineers, we will therefore be more innovative. Uh, and that that was almost an explicit part of the Clinton administration's policy. Does that sound right to you? Yeah, it's, it's the field of dreams argument, yeah. right? If, if we build it, they will come. Um, and, and again, there's this idea that engineers and scientists create jobs. Okay, one of the, the big controversies in the H-1B visa argument is that H-1B visa immigrants um, or green card immigrants uh, create five jobs for Americans for every every job would come in. But if you go back to 1964, uh, the first year of Spectrum, one of the one of the articles in Spectrum was by the ex um, head of, of Brookhaven Laboratories. If people remember who Brookhaven, what, what Brookhaven was at the time, uh, energy, and he said that every engineering PhD created 150 new jobs. Okay. Well, gee, if that was true, maybe we need to have more PhD engineers. Okay, we could solve the crisis right away with that. Um, again, it's, there's always this feeling that engineers, if we have enough, one of them will be smart. Okay, and one of them will figure out. In fact, if you read a lot of the literature, you'll see that some of it's very explicit in terms of saying, you know, we need to have these folks because they will be, you know. Folks who are going to who are going to create these new technologies, which is going to save the planet. Okay, they're going to solve the you know climate warming issue, or you know pick your poison. Again, it, does, it doesn't matter. Maybe they will, maybe they won't. Okay. Now the, the the other argument is is that you can never have enough scientists and engineers, because you know if if they're not in science and engineering, they're really smart people, and they'll go to other fields and increase their level of of expertise. Again, it's that's that may be true, but again, well, you create a, an yeah. embittered class of second-class citizens who then, after eight years of postdoc, can go on to another career on yeah. Napoli, for example. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the the other problem with the supply side um, uh, uh, argument is it assumes that that innovation is entirely a function of the ideas that go in on the front end of the of of the system, as if the regulatory environment, the economic environment, the social environment, all of these other, the, the difficulties of diffusion of new technologies, the, the way that, uh, that companies try to suppress innovation in their competitors, as if these aren't equally or more important. So again, it's kind of a context-free way of looking at the, yeah, well, again, at if the you, problem. If you go to Japan and you take a look at the percentage of engineers being graduated as in, in percentages of their graduates, you know, Japan should be the powerhouse of, of the universe. So it's, okay. it's not the independent it's, variable. It's not the, the independent variable. Yeah. Yeah. Then uh, I just want to make one more point and, and get your thoughts about it and then open up for discussion. So in doing so, I'm going to, I hope I won't irritate Gene in plugging uh, an, another uh, journal besides IEEE Spectrum, which we all actually love here at CSPO. <laughs> uh, but that is Issues in Science and Technology, which is uh, now a joint publication of, of uh, ASU and the National Academies. Uh, many of you uh, may may know that, but in the in the uh, last issue, uh, we published a, uh, an article similar in in tone and conclusions by Hal Salzman at, at Rutgers, and he makes a great point on the education front, which is that that um, given the size of our uh, population of students, we don't have any trouble educating very well a subpopulation of elites. To take the jobs that are needed in STEM, but what we don't do, what we then do, is relegate everyone else to the poor quality education that you're talking about. So, so we've survived um, in a very elitist uh, kind of a, a commitment to making sure that we do get enough of the scientists and engineers that we uh, that we need, but um, but then not worrying about all those others who don't get that kind of uh, an education. And that seems like it's consistent with uh, with what you've seen. Yeah, if you really want to get. Uh language and English teachers really irritated, go to any middle school or high school and say the word STEM. 
and they will they will spit that word back out at you because they are being relegated as as well you're not important you know when you have a governor of Florida saying well we only want to have scholarships for STEM students uh, and that if you're not a STEM student you basically don't matter uh, I, I think we've gone a little bit too far okay so um, why don't we see if there's any any uh, questions or comments? Uh, let me just start in the back. Yeah, please. By the way, I think this is a great article, and I've been kind of saying this for a while, but you must have seen that study by um, Vivek Wadhwa on, you know, 25% of the founders in Silicon Valley came, you know, are foreign-born. And so it's sort of this argument that it's, it's more of an argument for immigration and more STEM. And so I just, I'm curious what you think about that, because it's not a supply side argument, it's sort of like a demonstration looking at sort of companies started between 1995 and 2000, the number of them that had at least one foreign born um, founder. Well, I haven't dug into that in, in great depth, although, you know, there's, I've also heard some, some folks who have been picking apart some of that data, saying that, you know, the, how you count foreign-born right. I mean, founders. Right, I mean, Rin and say he's a foreign-born person, but he came here when he was seven. Right, and, and Andy Grove, he counted as, as a founder, and he sure. wasn't a founder. So again, you know, it, it depends. It, it, you know, the Valleys is, is, a, is an interesting little microcosm, you know, in, in the sense that they were the folks who brought in a lot of, you know, the H-1B visas and, and folks coming out of universities who went there, founded jobs, lived there, okay, and have a little microcosm. Now, I'd be much more impressed if you went to, say, Richmond, Virginia and did that study, or went down to Jacksonville, Florida, or went to Austin, Texas and did those, and then tell me what those numbers are. But to go out to the valley, you know, it's a, it's a self-selecting group. So I'm not, to be honest, uh, my engineering skepticism is, is fairly high on, on that. Uh, and, and my other one, other issue of that is, so what? <laughs> okay, what, what, am I supposed to impart something? As I said, I can, if I take my 1964 study, I just need PhD engineers. They're going to create a lot more than, than you know, the 25% who start jobs in the valley. Other questions? Anything in the back? Okay. Your comment about the rest of the world chasing each other around, if you look carefully at the arguments, they, are, they envy each other's system for particular reasons and not in general. Like the Chinese, they want to create more seed jobs, which we created the one, and so on and so forth. If you look at that, so it's, it's not, it's, 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 you should be more specific in when you say that. The second one on your last page, the real crisis, you say that there is a STEM knowledge shortage, and then you say there's a, not a STEM shortage. Obviously, you're talking about people versus knowledge, but usually you get knowledge through people, so how to, is there a yeah, connection between a little, the two? It, it can be seen to be as a contradiction. I, I think it, from a job standpoint, from, again, what, what Dan is talking teaching, about. Teaching STEM is not a job? Well, no, but, I, but I'm, if you take a look at what do we need as a society, what do we need to live as a society in terms of the knowledge base that we have, I think you know, having more science and, and engineering education is, is probably going to be necessary. Do we need more, what Dan would, you know, the, the elites, what Hal Salzman calls uh, the elites? Uh, probably not. Okay, we probably have, we, we've had in this country uh, the same, about the same number of, of kids who are interested in science and engineering for the longest period of time. We, we don't, I don't think we need to overly stimulate this, this marketplace. I think there's, there's plenty who want to, want to go into this field. Uh, again, I think it's a phony crisis, but I think that overall, um, you know, I think that, that having more, more science and engineering as well as arts training. I, you know, one of the things that, that I've been working with at the middle school where my daughter goes to is to try to get interdisciplinary science, mathematics, and English history um, work, uh, group projects among all the teachers. In fact, we, we're trying to get the history professor. For instance, you know, looking at when they're teaching something, a particular thing in, in uh, mathematics uh, is, well, where did that come from? What was, what was the time frame in history? Because it turns out that that's what they're studying at that time in, in, in their history class. 
What's a, what can you do in terms of writing? What was the great thoughts at that particular point in time? And then in science, well, they're learning about basic scientific principles in terms they have to do the eighth grade science project, which I'm getting roped into, um, is to, you know, try to try to tie that in as an inter interdisciplinary approach. Well, to do that, you better have a pretty broad background, both in arts and sciences and engineering and mathematics. And that's really where, where the, the, the emphasis I had, you know. Yeah, go ahead. Well, I, I'm curious if you have an opinion or if there is um, other stuff that you've seen related to where, for example, companies that are involved in science and technology, if they're interested in perpetuating their own interests, for example, but also, you know, helping society in general, but, you know, everybody's got limited funds, is, are there well, activities uh, that they could uh, well, invest well, the, in? That yeah, well, I, I think that, you know, the, in, in, in one sense, you know, the, the, the cry of the, of, of the crisis has been a nice stimulator for companies to go out and spend a lot of money. You know, Xerox, 3M, IBM, you know, across the board, government, you know, they, they're bringing, sending money, Intel, you know, as I said, uh, the school that, that uh, my daughter goes to was an Intel finalist. They got some, some bucks for, for uh, pushing, you know, for being one of the finalists. Um, you know, the University of Mary Washington has been sending money to the elementary schools, you know, in, in my area. Um, so there's been, a, there's been a, a good thing in terms of the crisis, if you will, in terms of getting companies to open up internships and everything else and, and to broaden that. But at the same time, you know, it's, it's hard to take cries of a shortage seriously when that same company lays off five or 10 or 15,000 engineers and scientists. And say that that you know they're the wrong type. You know, when I lived in England, you know, the trains were always running late because they had the wrong type of leaves or the wrong type of snow or the wrong type of you know. And that's kind of how how we we keep finding this. You know, I I kind of half kiddingly wrote in in one of my accompanying papers was that maybe they just need to kind of swap. Okay, just you know, if you fire them from Cisco, we'll go hire them at Microsoft. The guys you lay off there, you go you know send them someplace else. It's also it, it's bizarre that there seems to be no belief that students make decisions based on their understanding of the market. Yeah. I mean, I think we know that not to be true, and yet the assumption of those who are continually saying there's a crisis seems to be that students don't make choices yeah. like that. Well, or they blame the students. Okay, it's it's there's a at the end right. of the of, of the right. papers there, you'll see a little slide on, on the, the former head of Rolls-Royce, and um, he, was, he was talking, Boris Johnson, who's the mayor of London, I used to live in London, so I, I follow what's going on in the UK pretty, pretty closely, and uh, Boris Johnson, who is on the Conservative Party, is now the mayor of London, he was complaining about the fact that the UK had no nuclear engineers, this was a few years ago, and um, the head of Rolls-Royce at the time said, well, listen, if you don't have a nuclear industry, anybody who's smart enough to be a nuclear physicist is probably not going to be a nuclear engineer. Okay? Kids aren't going to be engineers for the sake of being engineers. If you read what the education department puts out in its literature in the commerce department, it says, well, listen, these are high paying jobs. Not as high paying as they were before, but they're high paying jobs, you know, in comparison to everybody else. And they like to compare it to high schoolers without any college education. They also like to say, well, it's for the good of the country. Okay, so the moment you hear code words like that, okay, it's for the good of the country, there's something else going, you know, some other, other thing coming into play. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm a little cynical here, but that's... Okay. Yep, two questions over here, so... I, I can't help but wonder if this crisis, so-called, keeps popping up every few years, somebody must be benefiting from, from pushing this idea, and have you what, what have you found on who, who benefits from ginning up this kind of concern? Well, I think the question of cui bono is, is pretty important. Now, the problem is, is that you know, you've got to be careful because you can sound like a conspiracist, mm -hmm. right? You can, you can say, well, you know, it's all these guys you know, sitting in a dark corner someplace saying that there's, you know, we're going to call a crisis, and, and, and there isn't one. But I think there's a lot of enlightened self-interest from all the different parties. You know, uh, the universities have a role to play in that they'd like to have a lot more enrollees. And in fact, if you go back again to the literature in the 19, late 1970s, early 1980s, in fact, about, I think, 81 or 82 is the year that there were more foreign graduate students than there were American graduate students in, in science and engineering. And um, University professors at that time were, were very upfront 
saying that, well, we need them to pay for graduate school because they pay basically pretty much full freight. And if you're a, my brother-in-law is a, a, bi, a botany uh, plant biologist at the University of uh, Chicago at Illinois, and he puts in for NSF grants, and if you get a grant, well, you need graduate students. Well, they're kind of cheap labor. Okay, so you, 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 have, you have something at the university level. Now, does the university worry about the rest of the United States? Well, probably not, that, but they have an incentive for doing that. Do you have industry, or do they have an incentive for having a, a, a shortage? Well, on the other side, yeah, because if they can get a surplus, who wouldn't like to have as many people as possible and to pay them as little as possible? You know, it's, it's, if, I, if I'm running my company, okay, I'm not, if I'm in a competition and if I'm in worldwide competition, I'm not going to say, okay, give me the most expensive people you got. Okay, you always have a trade-off between skill and wages that you're going to pay. And, and in a global economy, there's a lot of pressure on, on that, that skill. So there's, there's some incentive there. Government has a strong incentive because when was the last time government said, everything's okay, be calm and carry on? They're saying it right now. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> Good point. But that won't last. Um, but again, you know, it's, if, you're, if you're a politician, do you get elected by saying nothing's wrong? Okay. That, that's, just go back. And pay. this is a no-cost political issue. Yeah, it's like it, more yeah. science budget. It, yeah. Who can be against this? Yeah, who's, who's against more scientists and engineers? Okay, you'd have to be a Luddite to, to be against that. So, you know, it's, it's not this that, you know, all three are coming together and, and again, sitting in some you know, smoke-filled room or non-smoke-filled room. Um, you know, it's, it's that each one has, uh, you know, a, a particular advantage for, for carrying this on. They may be skeptical. Again, if you go dig deep, you talk to people off the record, eh, there's a little bit more skepticism there, okay, in terms of, well, but it might happen, okay, and you can't be too sure, okay. Um, so, again, it's just, it's just this, you know, pulling together. In, in defense, we call it the self-looking ice cream cone. <laughs> okay, you, you get all these things coming together to, to create this, this very, you know, interesting but fairly useless device, but it costs a lot of money and, you know, it looks really cool. There's another question over It appears to me that engineering is no longer a career, and that's actually, frankly, what I tell young people now. They expect that sometime along the line you're going to have to go away. In the Valley, we didn't hire anybody over 40 as an engineer. They all had to go somewhere else, move out of the valley, or you know, go work at a grocery store. Uh, you know, there really is no career path for engineering. And uh, you know, that could you speak a little bit on on that? Uh, we see no handicapped employees. You see dozens of, of spaces in front of the buildings. No handicapped employees because you can't work the 60 to 70 hours a week that's demanded in the valley. Well, the the, the founder of Facebook basically said that himself. He said, you know, I don't want people who are married who have a life. Okay, I want them to be devoted to the company. Um, you know, again, even when I was, my dad was an engineer for Sperry Univac a long time ago, and, and you know, as an engineer, he always told me, he says, when I was going into this field, he said, every three years you're up or you're out. Okay, now in the Valley, what's interesting is, is, is the, the language that they use, right? You hire the talent. Okay, well, think about that. You're, not hi you're hiring talent. Well, what does talent tell you? Well, talent is just like an actor or a sports professional. Okay, you hire somebody there to use for a certain amount of time, and then you get rid of them because you always have somebody who's, who's behind you. Right? I wrote an article about what happened to STEM careers in, uh, that's online uh, that looked at that because I've been in the field almost 40 years myself now. And so we, it's hard to tell a, 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 uh, a student, and students are not told this at high school, they're not told it at, at universities because I have a lot of my friends' uh, kids who are at Duke or at MIT or at Carnegie Mellon, my niece is at Carnegie Mellon, they're not telling them this. They're not telling them that, oh, by the way, you know, your career might only be seven or ten years if you can get a job in the first place. And so if, if that's the model, well, let's be, let's be frank with, with, with the kids and tell them that the model is like a professional sports model. You're there. Yeah, you may have a long life. You may be that, that individual uh, who can stay for a long time. But you're likely to better be off going into management, getting an MBA, doing something else, and view this as good grounding for a lot of other things that you can do. But I don't, it's, it's, not, it's not my field that I, I graduated into. It's not the field that you graduated into. 
um, it's different. So two groups that uh, I feel, you know, you, you uh, in the article, uh, both the uh, IEEE article and the U.S. News and World Report article in which you were quoted, um, you spoke to some recruiters, you uh, commented on government bodies that are looking at this problem. I was just curious whether or not you could comment on two other groups that uh, I think are a big deal in this, in this issue. Uh, one, any kind of uh, representative body of current applicants that are the STEM workforce as far as what they think, whether or not the shortage is there and how to characterize it. And then also the H-1B visa holders. And you know, they're, they're starting to come into the states uh, for education first. It's, we still always offer a great top-notch education in the nation. But then what are, how, how long are they staying? What is their economic outlook? Well, how are they looking at their careers? Are they coming here for education, going back home? Are they staying here for a little bit for skills and then essentially building themselves up to return home for, to start a new industry? How are those two groups seeing this uh, potential crisis? Well, I didn't investigate a lot in the H-1B visa. That's, that's more of Ron Hira and, and Hal Salzman and, and, and others. Um, you know, we... we had enough on our plate, to be honest, on, on what we wrote on. I can talk to it only in, in general strokes of what talking to some of the people who look at this in more detail is that um, a, a lot of the H-1Bs, you know, feel that they've earned a right to stay here mm -hmm. and that, that they contribute, and, and that's all fair. And, and one of the things I think that's been an absolute crying shame with the H-1Bs is, is that they become, a, you know, indentured servants in a lot of a lot of ways. Okay, where the green car or the, the H-1B visa is with the company, not with them. They can't move. It's very hard for them to move. And you know, we don't. And again, lack of data. I couldn't find anybody who has data about their diversion rate of people coming in who've then gotten their green card. How long they get to stay in the field? I doubt they're staying in the field for 20 or 30 years. Okay. The other thing is, is that what we what you don't have is you don't have any wage data on them over those seven years, six years that they're here as H-1Bs. You have their starting salaries, kinda, because they only have to report a general number. They don't have to, you know, they have to meet the uh, uh, prevalent wage, but the companies don't have to give you that data, and they don't want to give you that data. For instance, IBM, for instance, will not tell you at all how many Americans they have on their payroll anymore. Period. They, they refuse to. Um, and yet we know that it's probably of the 400,000, it's probably between 90 and 110,000 now. Okay. And, and IBM just settled with the Justice Department last week about abusing H-1B visas. So um, I'll probably get a nasty letter on that one. But um, now, I did interview a lot of kids who are in STEM as undergraduates. Um, you know, I have a lot of my, you know, I'm in an engineering community. Lots of their kids are going into, into that field, although a lot of them are not. Um, what's interesting is a lot of the community I live in is we have a lot of doctors, and a lot of the doctors will tell their kids, don't go into this field, don't go into medicine, because they're just, there isn't a good career for there for them. Um, and in fact, if you take a look at some of the, the surveys that have been done, about 60% of engineers tell their kids, don't go be engineers. Um, what's that song, don't let your son grow up to, be, to be a cowboy. Be a cowboy. Yes. Um, <laughs> Willie Nelson could probably have another hit or something. Mm -hmm. But um, we, should, we should do that. Yeah, we should do that. Um, and what, what's interesting, again, is that when you, is, is when you talk to the undergraduates in these programs, is they don't have a clue about what the market really is about, what they're facing. Because a lot of the professors have not worked in the field. They're not they're engineers, they're, they're great researchers and everything else, but they're not engineers. You, you don't have, there's some, but you know, for the most part they're, they're not. And a lot of them are older engineers as well because they got their PhDs, got into the faculties back you know, 10, 15 years ago. And, and there isn't a lot of turnover at, at the, in the engineering and science faculty level now. Um, you know, everybody keeps saying they're going to die off and retire, but that never seems to, seems to happen. So, um, but I think that what you do find is that the kids just, you know, they get shocked because they're, again, they've been kind of propagandized. You know, when I was an undergrad, I was propagandized, you know, and, and even as a graduate student, I was propagandized. Um, that, you know, if, you, if you're really smart, you will always find a job. You write your own ticket. You write your own ticket, especially if you're an electrical engineer. Did you know that, that in, in the uh, 19... Late uh, 1960s, early 1970s, electrical engineers were paid more than doctors. 
show me an electrical engineer who gets paid more than doctors today. On average, that was the average salary was more than doctors. Okay, so that's kind of where the field is. Let's have a last question and then break. One of the arguments that we make at our organization is that when you talk about STEM workers, you're talking about a largely male-dominated field. We frequently say, look, if you think there's a shortage, then you need to work on attracting women and helping get more of them into the field. You know, and we try to stay away from the h one b visa issue as well because it's complex and we don't want to seem xenophobic or anything like that. But you know, you look at that and you think, hey, that's maybe a way you could start filling those shortages if they actually exist. But the reality shows that women tend to leave the STEM pipeline for a variety of reasons, and those companies aren't changing the things that are causing women to not want to go work at these companies in the first place or pursue these fields. So my question is, what advice would you give your daughter? Well, it's interesting. My daughter's pretty smart, a lot smarter than I was at that age. And, and luckily, she's not yet devious. Um, <laughs> that would be a really bad combination. Either that or she's really devious. Or that she's really <laughs> devious. I haven't figured it out yet. Um, well, you know, what was interesting when my daughter wrote the piece, um, she had a lot of very good advice from commenters. And there was also a lot of very nasty advice that, that came. And, and she kind of smiled and said, this was, this was one of the reasons why you turn off women to go into engineering and science. Uh, and in fact, there's been a number of, of you know, the programmer. Uh, anybody, know, anybody else know what the programmer syndrome is? This is, this is the, the boys. The boys in the field who are, who are still fairly sexist and uh, don't like women in, in programming and don't like them in engineering either. Um, and in fact, if you take a look at the stats, most women go into bio, biology in those fields because that's, it's, it's nicer to them in, in many ways. Um, I told my daughter, I said, you know, she's interested in the arts. She takes theater courses. She also takes computer animation courses. She does all sorts of different things. Um, and again, you know, I, I keep asking, can I help you? And she said, no. Um, you know, for a dad, that's really hard. You know, he says, well, you, you're going to get to a math problem that you can't solve. No, nah, don't worry about it. Um, but her feeling is, is that she will probably get a STEM degree, even though she's not sold. Her article, if you read it, her editorial basically said, no sale. No sale yet. You haven't convinced me. But she will probably, you know, have a very strong uh, writing, literature, others. Um, and maybe she'll find something. But you know, what she wants to do, and I think it's pretty smart, and her, she has a younger sister going the same, same area, is to try to get as broad a background in the basics. Because she knows that math and science, especially mathematics, she isn't scared of anything. Because she, she can deal with anything that comes her way if she has a really strong math and science background. So I, I'm not too worried about it. You know, the only time I'm really worried about it is if she actually does ask me to help her with a math problem, and I'm not going to be able to, she'll, you know, because she'll say, well, you did this. And I'm going to say, well, that was a long time ago. I don't do that anymore. So, but, you know, I, I'm just hoping that she has a, has a good, broad background, and, and she'll be happy. I just told her to do what, what makes her happy. But she's going to have at least three careers, so she's better have a pretty good grounding, be able to be pretty resilient and, and quick on her feet. But isn't that the main... Trust, I think that we need to infuse STEM into a lot of other areas, adjacent yeah. areas, to really yeah. get. And maybe that's why I never let a good prices go to waste. I mean, if you look at it from a global competitive perspective, the world is driven by technology, whether we like it or not. And there are some people who don't like it, but it is what it is. So we need to infuse technology yeah. in a lot of aspects, which we all aspects of our lives. Yeah, but I think that Dan's comment though is, is that is this context, right? There's there's more than just the technology; it's the society. Who you know, we don't see how many American students are going to India to study? How many folks are going to France to set up businesses? What's, what's, what do we have here in the United States that allows us to do these things? Okay, it is, it is good engineering, good science, good technology. Uh, you know, we can fail in this country. Fail in other countries and see how far you get as an entrepreneur. Okay, if you can become an entrepreneur in the first place. So there's a lot that we have going right here. And I think you know, it might be good to, to actually just acknowledge that we have some pretty good, pretty good education here. Go back 20, 30 years. Go back to the Johnson administration and take a look at some of the papers written there about dropout rates, about you know, what, what we actually, what our kids knew then, and compare them to now. We've got pretty smart kids. 
And, and I think the, the point is that everything is connected to everything else. It's yep. not STEM infused into humanities. It is, it is, it is understanding it is. the connectedness yeah. among all these things yeah. in a really complicated world. We should come up with a different name. I don't like STEAM no, either. No, STEAM's terrible. You know? so, yeah. but, but, you know, I don't know. System engineering. <laughs> well, I get it. I, I don't know. Maybe we should run a contest. <laughs> With that, I want to thank you. Thank yeah, you, thanks, Bob. Uh, so um, people are free. In fact, we encourage everyone to, to hang around, get to know the people you're sitting next to, yeah. uh, continue the conversation. On, my, um, my email's in there, so all hate mail is welcome. And um, uh, I want to thank Bob and IEEE and all of you for coming, and I look forward to the next time. So thanks a lot. Thanks, thank you.